GenBio2. Welcome to the last video lecture of the entire semester of the craziest and most historic semester of history in a long time. Um, I've got mixed feelings about it being over, especially since I miss you all so much. Um, but Teaching online has been rough, and I'm sure learning online has been even tougher. So let's finish it off. I got a little dressed up today for our last lecture of the semester. Um, I have my very special collar pins on today. These are collar pins that are de designed by Ed Spivak at the St. Louis Zoo. And on them are the four endangered or extinct or threatened bumblebee species in the United States. Um, this one down here. Oh, I gotta take a look at them because I can't tell the video. This one down here is Bombus affinis. It was um, the first bumblebee to be listed on the endangered species list. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. This one right here is Bombus occidentalis. This is a threatened bumblebee in the United States. This one here is Bombus terricola. This is a threatened species throughout North America. And then this one here is Bombus franklini. This is a likely an extinct species in California of bumblebees. Um, and I got these pins at the bumblebee conference in Toronto last year. I've been coveting them for a really long time. And when Ed Spivak gave them to me, I felt like I really became a part of the bumblebee research community. This was like my official initiation. So um, I'm wearing these today because we're gonna talk about conservation biology. So they are particularly relevant. And um, because I do a little bit of uh, conservation science research, I thought I'd talk a little bit about me before we get into what conservation biology is as a field um, and some of the work that I've done. And then I'm gonna mention some projects I have ongoing um, that I'm getting funding for from the United States government that you can be involved in if you're interested in scientific research. So you just have to email me at the end of the semester and I'll have a bunch of genetic data you can play around with if you want. So let's, I'll talk a little bit about some projects I've done in conservation biology and then we'll get to like the meat of the lecture. So this is my website. I think I've shown it to y'all before. Um, here's this one project I was mentioning that I'm still getting funding for from the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, yeah, this project's still ongoing and I have a bunch of genetic data I'm going to be getting from bees I collected for this project coming hopefully this summer. I um, guess things might be a little delayed because of the pandemic, but um, this is a project exploring the effects of agricultural intensification, which we're going to talk about today, and a little bit about climate change and how they affect bumblebee populations um, in the wild and how they might affect individual bees in the lab. And so um, with my uh, postdoc advisor and my collaborators at the University of California, we did things like um, we saw how poor nutrition and uh, pesticide exposure affect the expression of genes in bumblebees in the lab. And then we've also got a project where I collected bumblebees throughout the Sierra Nevada mountain ranges in California to see what kind of pressures are affecting them in the wild. So this is one conservation project I have going on right now. Um, another project that um, I'm still working on too is looking at how um, bumblebee parasites threaten um, bumblebee popu wild bumblebee populations in the Arctic. Uh, so in 2016, yeah, wow, that feels like so long ago. I went on an expedition um, to the Arctic Circle in Alaska with a team of researchers from the University of California, and we collected a bunch of wild bumblebee species there so that we could, I could look at what's going on in their guts and what kind of parasites they have that might be threatening, threatening their populations in the Arctic. And then I also um, still have a project going on too. I'm gonna sequence a genome soon of one of these bumblebee species where I was doing a genetic study of a bumblebee species in Mexico and Central America, trying to see if um, understanding the genetics of this bee could help us understand its diversity in these different mountain ranges. And then I used this genetic data that I collected with my collaborators down here in Chiapas in San Cristobal de las Casas to write this report for the International Union for the Conservation of Nature on Bombus ephippiatus, the species I say for my master's and my PhD. 
um, dissertation. And then um, you can read this report if you feel like it. I'll include a link. I think I showed this to y'all earlier in the semester. Um, but here's um, just some descriptions of how the genetic data I collected informed um, how we classified the conservation status of all of the different genetic lineages within this group. So that's just some of the research that I've done on bee conservation, and I'll pepper it in a little bit throughout the lecture because it probably won't be able to help it. So that's a little about me. Um, now let's talk about uh, conservation biology as a field. So conservation biology seeks to understand how to preserve species, um, the communities that species live in, and ecosystems. And there are science, conservation scientists that work at all different levels, from the species to populations to communities to ecosystems. So uh, conservation biologists work at all those different hierarchical levels of ecology that we talked about. Um, and not it's an applied science, so it not only takes into, it, there's one area where you're trying to understand what's causing decline. So um, when I did that genetic study of that parasite uh, that is infecting bumblebee populations in the United States, that was, um, and actually all the research I do is trying to understand what's causing bee declines and what's causing harm to bee health. But there's another area of conservation biology, which is how can we take that information once we know what's causing the declines and how can we prevent those declines. And that's done more often by um, conservation, nonprofit conservation organizations. One in particular is the Xerxes Society, which is a great um, nonprofit organization that works on invertebrate conservation, particularly bumblebees. So you can study what's causing the declines and then you can try to figure out how to prevent those declines from uh, getting worse. Um, one th kind of a bummer thing we got to talk about with conservation biology is why we need conservation biology in the first place. Um, in the period that we live in right now, and not since the end of the Cretaceous, so millions of years, have so many species gone extinct in such a short period of time. Um, and so the field of conservation biology has arisen as a way to try to understand and mitigate the effects that humans are having on global biodiversity. Um, and it's not a it's not a it's not a super recent phenomenon. Humans have been causing extinctions of animals for thousands of years. About twelve thousand years ago is when um, humans crossed over the Bering Strait into well probably earlier than that. But about twelve thousand years ago is when um, we started to see the uh, extinctions and declines of mammoths, mastodons, horses, camels giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, lions, all these things used to exist in North America until they were hunted to extinction um, by humans. Um, so declines have been going on for a while now. Um, and so conservation tried, biology tries to understand the causes of these extinctions and declines and how we can present, prevent them and then also how can we restore species that have been threatened by human activities. So let's talk about some of the things that are responsible for extinction. I already talked that human facilitated extinctions have been happening for thousands of years, um, but with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, um, major, major unprecedented declines, um, at least within this period, are occurring. So historically, about 1.7% of mammal species and 1.1% of known bird species have gone extinct since the 1600s. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with global travel um, and uh, colonization from Western peoples that caused a lot of these historical extinctions. Um, majority of the extinctions that we're seeing, though, have occurred since the 1900s. Um, and within that period, five species of plants and animals per year have gone extinct during the 20th century. So very, very dramatic declines. Um, some of the factors that are responsible for this, one in particular is over-exploitation. Um, before there was no previous understanding of uh, animal declines and those effects they might have on the planet, and so a lot of animals have been hunted and trapped to extinction, um, mostly by colonists. Um, and this figure here um, is a figure illustrating the collapse of uh, the 
a, a fishery of cod. Um, you start to see this really steep decline in the 1970s and the 1990s um, due to overfishing of these populations so that they couldn't sustain themselves anymore. Um, they haven't really bounced back since then. And then in this figure, um, this is the uh, world catch of some whale species in the 20th century. Um, so huge numbers of whales are being caught in the thousands. Uh, and this is leading to um, uh, ex near extinction of a lot of large um, mammal species in ocean waters. Um, so these are just two examples. Um, bison were hunted near extinction. There's now restoration efforts in the in the North America to restore these populations. Um, passenger pigeon is now extinct. That's one example of an animal that was hunted to extinction. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the dodo bird, another example of an animal hunt hunted to extinction. Um, so overexploitation is one factor responsible for extinction. Another one is habitat loss. Um, one might be, so the, the four factors involved in habitat loss, one is just the destruction of habitat, one is the pollution of habitat, one is the disruption, and then the other is habitat fragmentation. And each of these works just slightly differently. Um, destruction, um, one really common cause is deforestation. Uh, this is clear-cut logging for agricultural purposes. Um, this figure here is showing habitat loss in Madagascar. 90% um, of the eastern coast forests have been lost to human population growth and, and deforestation in Madagascar, and so that has also caused huge declines in extinction of the species that live in these forest communities. Um, grazing, so developing agricultural lands, particularly for pasture animals um, like cattle, has also caused a lot of loss of habitat because um, the cows will, they'll plow through and kill all the native plants in that area and then grow grass and hay for the cows to feed on, and then the cows, they trample that soil, they disrupt the nutrient cycles in those soils, um, and that's just com complete removal of habitat. And then also urban development, too. These are two things that are just complete destruction of the habitat, so nothing that was previously there is, is there before, is there anymore. Um, and then you have pollution. Um, two examples of things we have here in Pencil Western Pennsylvania are acid rain and industrial waste, um, particularly uh, mining waste. Um, we'll talk all about this in my ecology class, but um, mining is breaking up of rocks, and then it exposes those rocks to water, and then that water causes um, metals and other hazardous um particularly heavy metals to leach out of that water and then flow into the waterways and be particularly toxic and damaging to aquatic plants and animals. Um, same with acid rain. Um, and then you can have disruption, so things like tourism, really high human traffic that might interfere with the mating be behaviors of animals or like constant foot traffic might interfere with the growth of native plants. Um, the Galapagos Islands are a great place that has started to limit the number of people that are allowed to visit them. A lot of people visit them every year for ecotourism because they're concerned about conservation and they want to protect it and they're these delicate habitats um, on earth that people want to see while they're still around, but they've started to limit tourism because it started to negatively impact the species in the Galapagos Islands. So tourism can actually be disruptive enough to cause um, habitat loss. Um, and then another example, insecticides I would also consider part of pollution. It depends on how you think about it. Um, but the use of insecticides in agricultural crops, um, particularly ones called neonicotinoids that I'm working on right now for my uh, grant from the United States government, um, is studying how those pesticides then affect pollinators. So you put them in your crops to kill off pests that are eating your plants, but they have all these things called non-target effects where they affect um, the pollinators that they need to maybe pollinate the flowers on your crop. Uh, and if you reduce those pollinator species, then you have lower yields in those crops um, when you were just trying to kill a pest insect in the, per in the first place. And then you have habitat fragmentation. So this is cutting up one contiguous piece of habitat into a bunch of different pieces. Um, 
And what happens is that when you cut up these pieces of habitat in this in this figure here, this is tropical rainforest in Brazil, and a lot of habitat loss has been here has been due to logging and clear cutting of land for agriculture, is you limit the connections between these plots. We've talked about gene flow really, really early on in the semester. And if we isolate each of these little patches, you limit the amount of gene flow between uh, individuals in a population if you cut between these patches. So then what happens is you limit the gene pool, you limit the genetic diversity, you limit their ability to change to new environments. Um, you can also start to cause inbreeding because they're not, you don't have gene flow between these patches and that can ultimately affect the um, status of a species growing inside these habitat patches. So these are all different aspects of habitat loss. And then you can also, um, one thing that threatens species is the introduction of non-native species. Um, so non-native species are species that are not native to that area. And what happens is when they're introduced into new areas is that um, maybe there's a predator that's not there or there's a competitor that's not in these new, spe in these new areas. Um, and they can explode and start to cause the decline of species that are native. One that I just talked about in my invertebrate zoology class are zebra mussels. Uh, these have been introduced into waterways in the eastern United States and they are uh, they'll outcompete native mussel species. They'll outcompete plants for space on the ground, uh, in the sediment, in lakes, and in streams. Um, they can clog up pipes, and they travel around really easily on boats. Um, if you are into fishing um, or boating, maybe you've seen signs that talk about cleaning your boats to make sure you don't travel these zebra mussels around. Um, another example of an invasive species of the Lake Victoria Nile perch, um, they were introduced in the 1950s for fishing purposes. Um, and then during the 80s, unrelated to the introduction of the Nile perch, there were really high inputs of nutrients from agricultural runoff and sewage into the Nile that led to eutrophication, which is a really, it's this huge increase in nutrients that are being put into waterways that then feeds the algae, and you get something called an algal bloom, these huge booms in the populations of algae. That algal bloom then increased all the populations of the cichlid fishes, which normally wouldn't have been a big deal, but now there's this new invasive species there, the Nile perch, that feeds on all these cichlid species. And what happened is that as the cichlid numbers increased, so did the Nile perch, and the perch ate almost all of these cichlid species to extinction. Um, so this is just one example of all the cascading effects that in introducing non-native species can have on ecosystems. Um, take a second to think of some current problems you might know about. Um, one in eastern Pennsylvania that almost immediately comes to mind to me is Japanese knotweed. Y'all might not know about it. Um, it's not super common in La Trobe and out near Greensburg where our school is um, just because we don't have as much um, clear-cut and disturbed areas along, ro along roadsides, but it is all over Pittsburgh. I see it everywhere, and it's starting to come back. It's a non-native species um, from Japan, Japanese knotweed. Uh, it was introduced because it is kind of pretty, but now it is a terrible, terrible invasive species, and it's very, very hard to get rid of. Um, let's talk about some other examples. Um, one, these are some examples that are sort of local. Um, kudzu, all of these were introduced. They're not native to the eastern United States. Um, and because they have a lack of competitors from their native areas or um, there's a new resource that's open up to them, their populations explode and they cause, start to cause the decline of native species. Um, emerald ash borer now has all these ash trees it can feed on, so it's causing huge declines in ash populations. This is a really weird invasive fish species that can actually crawl outside of the water, so it's really easy for it to spread to new waterways. Um, Asian carp are another really great example. Um, and so is kudzu. This stuff just grows all over and it just blocks out all the light from native species and grows all over it. Um, and like I said, Japanese knotweed is another great example of a non-native invasive species. Um, yeah. 
So let's talk a little bit about how um, conservation biology at um, the ecosystem level and how changing one aspect of an ecosystem can then have these cascading effects on all the organisms that are living in that balance there. So let's talk about um, whaling in these um, coastal, coastal shoreline habitats along Alaska. Um, so whaling, and um, you should definitely look at this figure in your textbook too, um, it, so you can read all this text really clearly. Whaling has caused a, lock, a lack of these plankton eaters in the ocean. These whales eat tons and tons of plankton. I just actually talked about this in my crustacea lecture. Um, these plankton populations are huge. Plankton are super numerous, but when you remove these large, massive animals that are eating all this plankton daily in there, you've got a huge increase in the plankton population, which then causes increases in the pollock, which is a fish population. The increases in these pollock populations then um, start to cause an increase in the perch and herring, loss of perch and herring in the, these ecosystems. When you lose the perch and the herring, you start to lose the seals and the sea lions because they feed on the perch and the herring. Um, a decrease in these seals and sea lion populations causes a reduction of prey for orcas, these large predators that are in these shoreline ecosystems because they don't have their food to feed on. So you can see how this is a very intricately linked food web um, in these shoreline habitats. Um, orca, because they don't have seals and sea lions to feed on, they start eating otters because that's what's left. That's what's around. If when they start reducing numbers in the otter populations, then you don't have otters around keeping the sea urchin population at bay. Um, now that the sea urchins aren't getting eaten as much, they're starting to consume huge numbers of this kelp forest. Sea urchins are voracious algae eaters, and it's important for the otters to be around so that they can keep those numbers at um, a sustainable level. But when they start to reduce their population, the sea urchin populations explode. They start to eat all of the algae. When you lose this algae, you lose habitat for fish that live there. You lose the habitat, you start losing the fish, and then there's no food for eagles and birds of prey. So whaling has led to all these enormous cascading effects and even affects eagle and bird populations on land because of this intricately linked food chain that exists here in this shoreline habitat. So what are some ways that we can work to solve these conservation problems? Um, one is through habitat restoration. So you can start to reintroduce the native species that have been eliminated from a habitat, um, particularly plant species. If you can collect seeds from local areas and then try to do uh, conservation efforts, there's a really great trail that I've been going to in uh, Pittsburgh called the Trillium Trail. If you <laughs> follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen pictures of it. Um, this place is a habitat restoration project that is mostly ha restoring habitat by putting a fence around the entire area that keeps deer out. The deer population, this is also another great ex ex um, example of an extinction cascade. So like, y'all know white tear deal are everywhere around here. And that's because we have killed off and reduce the populations of their predators. And so the populations exploded. Those deer are voracious eaters of saplings and other um, plants that grow in the forest understory. And so it is crazy to drive up to a trillion per trail because you can tell where deer are kept out and where deer are allowed to roam because there's nothing green on the forest floor where there's deer. And then you get to the trillium trail where the whole thing is fenced in to keep deer out and there's wildflowers everywhere. It's nuts. That's one example of habitat restoration. Um, so you can reintroduce those native species, like all the flowers, all the wildflower species that are on the Trillium Trail in Pittsburgh. Um, you can start to reintroduce animals and plants, um, but you got to think about um, proportions. You know, you don't want to reintroduce so many spe spe seeds of one wildflower that it starts to swamp out another wildflower species, right? You want to have some sort of balance um, if you have any historical data, so like um, herbarium collections or museum collections, like the ones that are at the Carnegie, are really great for conservation 
um, because we can look at them and try to understand what might have been the historic populations were like so that we can reinstate them. Um, and you try to establish a, a working ecosystem again in an area. Um, another way you can restore habitat is not just by reintroducing the species that used to be there, but removing introduced species. Um, so Japanese knotweed is a huge problem here in, in uh, Pittsburgh and in Pennsylvania. And so there are a lot of um, conservation programs to remove this stuff every year. Same with honeysuckle. It's not nearly as bad as Japanese knotweed around here. Um, other parts of the country, honeysuckle is real bad. Where I grew up in, near in Kentucky and Cincinnati, it's pretty bad. But there are programs where people go out, volunteers go out every year with their gardening gloves and just remove all this stuff so that native species can start to grow back. Um, and then you can also do cleanup and rehabilitation. So the wetlands at uh, St. Vincent are a great example of trying to clean up a polluted area. So those artificial wetlands that have been created on campus are to help um, remove the um, heavy metal pollution from the local waterways to try to restore some of the um, native species to our local waterways and also make the water cleaner and healthier for us, but also for the animals that live in it. Um, so lots of conservation going on right at St. Vincent. And Miss um, um, Bollinger in chemistry is in charge of the wetlands, if you know her. You can also do um, captive breeding or reintroduction programs. Um, and depending on the kind, these can have varied success. So um, you can catch very delicately and with a lot of care and understanding of the species that you're working with, you can captive breed them in facilities and then release them out into the wild. This is um, some data from your textbook of breeding peregrine falcons and then releasing them into the wild. This is a 25-year program that's been going on. Um, and if you think all the way back to our very first bio blitz, one really important consideration for these captive breeding and reintroduction programs is thinking about genetics. You don't all want to catch like a bunch of brothers and sisters and then mate them together for years and years because you're going to cause inbreeding and all the things that come along with inbreeding. So you have to do captive breeding very, very, um, with a lot of understanding of genetics and the behavior in the habitat of the species that you're working with. Zoos actually, um, Accredited zoos, not like Joe Exotic zoos, like actual zoos like the Cincinnati Zoo and the St. Louis Zoo, um, they keep these things called stud books where they trace the family lineages, of, particularly for like um, birds of prey and large mammals um, and ungulates. They keep these things called stud books so they know like the pedigree of all the animals in the zoo and then they'll match them up. They'll do a little like dating matchups with these animals to get them to breed so that they reduce inbreeding in these populations of endangered species that are kept in zoos. So accredited zoos, not Joe Exotic zoos, are really important for conservation of species too. Um, these are just a couple examples. There's lots of examples of breeding programs for birds of prey. Um, the peregrine falcon and California condor are some of my success stories. Yellowstone wolf, there's, I'll post this great video. There's this guy who's like a really very animated narrator um, on this video about the introduction, reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone. But it's a great video for illustrating like the cascading benefits that can happen from introducing um, a keystone species back into a habitat. Oh, that reminds me, I forgot one really important concept I wanted to introduce you and I want you to be prepared to understand for the exam. Um, otters in these shoreline ecosystems are keystone species. And I'm not sure if we've talked about this concept before, um, but we are the keystone state. Y'all should know what a keystone is. It's little, I'm making gestures with my hand, but y'all can't see them. Uh, they're little pieces that, um, support are integral and in the support of building structures and they're called keystone these keystones if you remove them they'll cause the collapse of the entire building so they're important for the inf the structural integrity of buildings so species that are keystone species are integral to the functioning of ecosystems sea otters are keystone species in these shoreline habitats because if you remove them from all of these cascading effects then they cause huge changes 
in the dynamics of this ecosystem. Um, Yellowstone wolves are keystone species in Yellowstone, and I'll um, share this really great, it's not too long, it won't take you too long to watch, I'll share this really great video with you about um, how reintroduction of this keystone species has caused all these amazing cascading effects to happen in Yellowstone. Um, so that's it. That's our last lecture for the semester, everyone. Can you believe it? We did it. We made it. Um, I'm so proud of each and every one of you for surviving this insane semester. So many of you are freshmen, and this is just like such a crazy way to start your college careers. Like, years from now, you'll have like nieces and nephews and grandchildren who are probably going to like interview you for school projects about what it was like living through the coronavirus pandemic. Like, you're going through your first year of college in one of the craziest periods in recent history. And I'm so proud of all of you for just surviving it. Um, and I'm so excited to keep working with you for the rest of your college career. Um, I love you all. Um, good luck on the exam. I'll see you in the exam review tomorrow. Okay, bye. <laughs>